I am Liberty. I'll be, I'm the co-organizer of the Pop Society and I'll be running this event with Professor Joseph Agassi. So Joseph Agassi is Professor Emeritus at Tel Aviv University and York University, Toronto. Toronto, um, Toronto yes, yeah, sorry, York University, Toronto. He's written several books on history and philosophy of science, aesthetics, uh, politics and education. Uh, and he's written hundreds of articles about uh, covering a range of topics in the sciences and humanities. From 1953 to 1957, he studied under Popper at the London School of Economics, and he later went on to write a book about his time with Popper, which is called A Philosopher's Apprentice. More recently, he's written reflections on the education system and academe, in particular, um, a book called Academic Agonies and How to Avoid Them, which is from 2020. Um, this is Professor Agassi with his family and Popper in 1957. This is them at the Austrian College in uh, 1954. Professor Agassi, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's an honor. So my first question for you is, um, in The Philosopher's Apprentice, um, you described how you came to London with all kinds of controversial opinions, um, even if you also had a lot in common with Popper. Um, so I was just wondering, where did Popper influence your thought the most? Uh, first of all, my controversial opinion was that we cannot think without metaphysics, that metaphysics gives us our sense of proportion. And although Popper did not take metaphysics at the time that seriously, he became more and more pro-metaphysics as he grew older. At least he never was anti-metaphysics, which was the fashion at the time. So that I had affinity with him at once. Is that, so is that view of met metaphysics related to the, to the Vienna Circle view? Decidedly, because the Vienna Circle learned one thing from Wittgenstein, that there is no such thing as metaphysics. Right. I don't think in the whole history of philosophy, there was an opinion more stupid than that of the Vienna Circle. Right, yes, I'll, um, I will ask you about them later. Um, yeah, and another thing um, that you talked about in Philosopher's Apprentice was your search for a teacher before meeting Popper. And I've just got a quote from it. So talking about your first encounter with Popper, you comment, it was a tremendous relief to meet the philosopher and savor his attitude to science as intellectual admiration with no intellectual servility. Uh, and another quote was, uh, science is better off not defended, but severely criticized by frank admirers. This is not easy to discover. It appealed to me greatly when I learned it, but learn it I had to, and from the philosopher Karl R. Popper. Um, so do you think the-, the I want to compliment you. You chose the right passages. There are so many great one-liners in your book. So um, yeah, but- oh, so Thank my you, thank is, you. Um, do you think- We're in a mutual admiration society. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so the question was just gonna be um, like, so do you think the attitude of intellectual civility is still common now? Oh, more so. Why do you say that? Because I think I observe it. I don't know. I may be mistaken, but that's my impression. You see, the university that I studied in does not exist. The university? Uh, how do you mean? I mean, when I graduated, which was in 52, there were new winds coming from the United States. There were in my country, two or three professors who came from the States with a mission to Americanize the European university. And they did, and they did successfully. I give you one example. I, I don't have a first degree, but I have a second degree for which I passed three exams. Today in the American Style University, in each semester, a student has more than three exams. What, how is that related to the, 
to the idea of intellectual civility because I, I the way I understood it was something like um, using a lot of arguments from authority like no 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 the wish to study as opposed to the wish to get a degree okay for example when I came to Popa he said to me don't switch to London School of Economics because you will disqualify from a degree come informally and I said I don't care for a degree I'm passing by the way, they did give me a degree. They also wanted me to sit for an exam because I moved from physics to philosophy. So I refused to sit for an exam. I have two letters from the academic secretary of the University of London. One tells me, stop pestering me, you will never get a degree from my university. And the second says he was very glad to inform me in retrospect. Right. Yeah. The way you <laughs> described it in the book, it sounded almost like a like an administrative error or yeah, something uh, like that. Yes, of course. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. And another thing I came across um, while just reading about you is there is supposedly Popper uh, gave the instruction to students to write it for Tilza. Um, so referring to your daughter Tilza. So um, I was just wondering did you, um, I just, I thought this was endearing because he's saying um, you should write it, write so that ch a child can understand you. Exactly so. Uh, yeah, like it's a good, it's a good thing to want to write clearly. And that's what the quote seems to be about. Um, so do you, do you remember any conversations where, like, do you remember when Popper first said this to you and did he really say this to people regularly? Oh yes, I also describe it in great detail in my book how he tried to teach me how to write, yes. By the way, another thing, he corrected a manuscript of mine without telling me, which made me protest, of course. Okay, all right. But just the, the specific uh, maxim, write it for Tirza, did, did he say that a lot? Was that kind oh, of- Oh yes, repeatedly. Okay, all right. Yeah, very nice. I, th I think it's, if I can jump in, uh, it's quite nice that Popper had this uh, emphasis on writing clearly and I think it fits with his philosophy uh, and I was wondering what you think about that well, it, do you think that writing clearly is uh, kind of encouraged by critical rationalism on the contrary Popper believed in a very important thesis which I think is wonderful and it is what you say is not what comes out of your mouth it's what enters the ears of your listener and I think this is true and very important and yet Popper constantly complained of misunderstanding, which I consider uh, an error on his part. Because you think he should have written more clearly or he should have uh, taken into he, account? He worked very hard. You know, he wrote the Open Society on the average 30 times. After the book went to the printer, he rewrote chapter 24 completely, for example. He, he, he worked very hard, day and night. And I, I do not commend it. I don't demand of my friends or peers or students to work hard. I think hard work is a mistake. That's also very interesting. How, how come? What's, what's the mistake uh, with hard work? If I gave you the job of playing music to a crowd or of cleaning a latrine, then you would know the difference. Sorry, of uh, playing music to a crowd or, and then uh, you cut out for me for a second. Can cleaning, you please repeat that? Cleaning latrines. Right, very nice. The word hard work is a euphemism for unpleasant work. There was a, a new organization that made really great change, which was called Organization for the, for the Improving of the Quality of Working Life. And it turns out that people care about their work and do it voluntarily, but it has to be better than cleaning latrines. Right, I, th I think that also somewhat fits in with the comment you made earlier about exams, uh, which I'm also very curious about, because you said that uh, it's, you, you, you implicitly seem to draw a distinction between studying 
and learning about a subject and, and doing exams. Uh, Certainly, the studies for exam, to be fair, has to fix the curriculum very clearly. Whereas anyone who studies for love knows that the study should take you where it does. So this is a strict conflict between uh, working for exams and following your heart. Yes. Yeah, I, I find myself agreeing a lot with that. Thank and, you. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Do you, again, do you think that that is kind of part of the of Popper's philosophy or of his influence on you? Or because I, I yeah, I, I find myself coming from the same. I, I have I have the similar ideas to you about about exams and universities. Yeah, um, I, I must say quite generally. First of all, I owe everything to Karl Popper. This is unqualified. Secondly, he he was suspicious. I'll give an example. Uh, years after we separated and didn't meet and hardly corresponded, I met him at a conference. And he gave a talk and I sat in the audience and he noticed me. And he told me afterwards that he expected me to stand up in the middle of his lecture and to walk out demonstratively. Now, why he told me that, I don't know. But his feeling that way is characteristic of him, not of me. Huh. Yeah, that's very peculiar. I, I think but this um... is, I, I'm reporting to you. I mean, whatever you read into it is your affair, but I'm reporting to you the story as I remember it. Yes. Yeah, that he generally seemed to have a hard time dealing with criticisms from uh, his previous students. No, no, I must qualify that. This is what many people understand. He loved criticism. He mm. only thought that his students should not publish criticism of him. Right. This is where we disagreed, but one has to say it's not that he didn't like criticism. He loved it. That is also very interesting. So, yeah, yeah. so the important distinction is between public criticism and private criticism. I'm still alive. You can come and tell me. If you don't do that, you don't trust me to believe in criticism. Now, what I've said is silly. I think Popper knew that Popper was no judge of his qualities. Yeah, I, I, I noticed that the topic of criticism comes up a lot um, in your writing. Um, so you discuss how criticism is often confused with hostility, even though if you, if you kind of take the time to uh, pose your criticisms of something, it's really a mark of recognition. Um, yes. So this is a, just a question for, for you. To, yeah. When is criticism beneficial and when is it not beneficial? Yeah. Uh, the idea that you mention appears in Plato's Gorgias, for example, also in the Book of Laws, but in the Gorgias, it's, it is a subject matter of a dialogue of Plato, that criticism is beneficial, and therefore your critics is your, your doctor, says uh, Socrates. And I don't know why Popper said, if you publish your criticism to me, then you don't trust me to accept your criticism. He took this as an insult. And not only his devoted disciples and students, but even casual students of his, like Tom Kuhn. Kuhn participated in one seminar that Popper gave in Harvard. And so Popper thought that Kuhn should not have criticized him. But they, I mean, but they wrote public. They, they publicly wrote their criticisms of each other. That's correct. The person who organized that was Lokatos. Lokatos realized that his catapult to fame would come from bringing Popper, Carnap, and Kuhn together, and that's what he did. Mm. He got money from Rockefeller to organize a conference. Why did Lakatos try to discredit you? Sibling rivalry. rivalry. But uh, yeah. We have, we have a very good friend. 
he lived in my home for a few weeks. When he was really broke, he stayed in my home. Uh, by the way, he was an inveterate liar and he never lied to me. He couldn't lie to me. We, we really were friends, there's no question about it. And only after he died, I realized how much energy he invested in uh, sabotaging my career. Mm. Um, but yeah, what, what did he say were the reasons? Did he have criticisms of your philosophy, for example? No, 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 I'm certifiable. What, what does that mean in this context? It means uh, medically uh, registered as mentally ill. Oh, and he, oh, okay. Oh, I see. So it wasn't related to your publications or anything? No, 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 no. On the contrary, he wrote to Feyerabend that we ostracize Agassi, but not his writings. Oh, right. Okay. He said excommunicate, by the way, but he meant ostracized. Wow. wow. Uh, yeah, you also, you mentioned uh, that you only discovered after he passed away that he had How much tremendous effort. Me. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, why do you say that? I'm very yeah, I'm curious uh, what makes you say that. Uh, because within months of his death, some veils were lifted and some uh, uh, approaches became open to me, which were not open to me then. It's very funny. I found out later that, for example, when he heard that an editor accepted a paper of my publication, he would go to that editor, sometimes travel to him and try to force him to withdraw his acceptance. Oh. Yeah, that's that's bizarre. Yeah, that, that is very unusual. Okay, By the yeah. way, he, he was extremely imaginative and he had a terrific sense of humor. And when he was caught red-handed, he always knew what jokes to tell to dissipate the unpleasant situation. He was really somebody, there's no question about it. And as you know, he was self-destruct. You know that he forced a young woman to commit suicide and that that was a shadow on his life, all, all his life. I didn't know that. No, neither did I. There oh. is a paper by Jancis Long on Lokatos in the General Philosophy of the Social Sciences. And there she tells a story. She studied, made a research on him. It's called Lokatos in Hungary. And the, the story about uh, him forcing someone to commit suicide is is in that uh, work. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, I, also, I definitely one, one should check it out. not forget that he was a Holocaust victim. Yeah, no, I I wasn't aware of any of this. Uh, Let me just not mention the... one thing. Karl Popper said, "I learn nothing from my students except from Lokatos about mathematics." That is in Popper's autobiography. Is, is that in uh, Unended Quest? Yeah. Huh, I haven't uh, come across that. I, I, I trust you completely on it, but yeah, uh, I haven't noticed that. That's very strange. Because uh, you'd think that David Miller had very interesting criticisms of, of Popper's uh, theory mm. of verisimilitude, for example, and I think he even acknowledged yeah, this elsewhere. No, no, not the theory of verisimilitude, the formula huh. of verisimilitude. Right. Mm. Okay, so he... the. Yeah. Um, I, I must tell you, I wrote a paper in mind called To Save Verisimilitude, and it angered Popper very much. Oh, really? How come? Because you, you'd think that uh, verisimilitude was something he'd want to have saved. Yes. So what made him angry about it? Or is that unknown? I have not even a conjecture. They're very peculiar. Yeah, again, uh, something I wasn't aware of. Yeah, um... Popper, I, I must say that thing about Popper. Popper was one of the most generous people I ever met. And he was always suspicious. And these two things are in such an enormous contrast that he could switch from enormous friendliness to great anger and back. And that really unhinged people. Yeah, well, the yeah, I think it's just uh, it sounds like there was a very complicated relationship between Popper and his students and everybody except his wife. Right. She was a tower. All oh, right. 
did you were on good terms with her, weren't you? Oh, of course. At the end, she thought I was bad for him and so on, but we were on very good terms. Um, she yeah, was but... loyal to him, of course. You have to realize that. Mm -hmm. But she, she was a marvelous woman. I can't tell you how impressive she was. And always quiet, always at the background, never conspicuous. Mm. Yeah, but just uh, so leaving aside the complicated personal relationships um, and going back to the theme of criticism. Um, so wh when I was reading your book, I was thinking about this idea of when is criticism beneficial and when is it not beneficial? So one context in which this comes up is the current pandemic. Um, and there are, so there are people who criticize the received opinions about um, the pandemic and the risks. Um, so you call them COVID skeptics, people who deny, for example, they deny that masks work or they yeah. claim the vaccine is dangerous. Um, so where would you place them in the, in the line between? First of all, I would like to quote one of the most remarkable things Popper ever said. He said, every criticism is beneficial, including criticism that rests on misunderstanding and nothing more. That I think is marvelous statement. It's as extreme as you can put it. But but you also talk about the benefits of withholding criticism. Um, that, for example, uh, you at, at one point you mention mathematicians and how you admire them for their ability to listen to an entire discourse and withhold critis criticism. Yeah, let, let me put it that, that way. People always speak of the suspension of judgment, meaning the refusal to criticize. And I think it's a very important when you hear an exposition to listen to it as favorably as you can and put aside all criticism. Very often you listen to a lecture and you say, doesn't the lecturer know? And then say, never mind, just forget and go on. And later we'll come to terms with that. I think this is good advice. By the way, you can't appreciate art without suspension of uh, belief mm -hmm. and of disbelief. That is to say, if you enter a picture, you are schizophrenic. If you don't enter a, pic a picture, you have no sense of art appreciation. So what you do is flip flop. Right. Yeah. That's very nice. Very Thank nice. you. Um, but what, what about the question of, of COVID skeptics? So it's the same, it's the same. When you see people uh, uh, expressing really outlandish views about COVID, stop and say, what's going on here? Don't rush and just say, ah. It's very easy to say, ah, especially when it is, ah. But wait, wait, just take the stupidest people around in your country and say, what goes on? Why are they so vehement in expressing this opinion? After all, it's below the intellectual level. That's what makes it conspicuous. That's what makes it remarkable. That all of a sudden, intelligent people with normal common sense understanding, all of a sudden speak about conspiracies and so on, right? So stop and say what goes on here. Don't rush to say this is uh, beneath their level, which it is. Never mind that. Just put it aside for a minute. So I think suspension of disbelief is just as much as suspension of belief. You have to be able to do both. And you have, as I say, you have to flip flop. Okay. And so you think we should address the, the concerns of COVID skeptics, no matter how outlandish we think their concerns yeah. are? Yeah. And it is my conviction that it's outlandish. It doesn't bother me. You still think we have something to learn, basically. Uh, like that. That's right. It's the, That's right. Yeah. yeah, that That's makes right. sense. Never miss an opportunity to learn. Thank you. Yeah. Um, That's a nice way of putting it. Another question related to COVID. Um, just while we're talking about it, um, what, what is your view on the restrictions on personal freedoms that have followed the pandemic? Do you think they're opposed to the open society? First of all, I, I'm surprised. You know very well that in 
already in Roman democracy, when times were hard, there was dictatorship, half a year dictatorship. I don't know if you know that. In the Re Republic of Rome, they would appoint dictators for half a year. Uh, if you take Winston Churchill, he certainly was the strongest man on earth at the time. There's no question about it. And people yielded power to him voluntarily. Not before he became prime minister. That's another story. And it was a touch and go. I don't know if you know. He became a prime minister really at the spur of the moment and without much consideration and so on. You know the story. It's amazing. Nice. But the moment he ascended to power, people yielded to him. And they yielded everything unconditionally because it was hard times. And that's my answer to you. Okay, yeah, right. And yeah, so I'll ask you a couple of questions about education. Um, if you don't mind, I'll read another quote um, just because I, I watched an interview with you from a few months ago. Um, and it, I think it really brings out the theme of education in your writing very well. Um, so it was in answer to the question, what is your philosophy? You answered, First of all, that there's enough suffering in the world that we don't have to add to it. There's a philosophical principle that's common to the whole world, which is that there's an opposition between the individual and society, and that the individual always has to concede because society can exist without the individual, but not the other way around. What I just said was accepted by the majority of your teachers. If you had a good teacher, um, it was a person who did not agree with what I just said. So could you elaborate on this? So why is, there, um, why is there thought to be an opposition between the individual and society? First of all, what is so very impressive about the liberalism of the modern world is that only in the 20th century, it has been discovered that most of the sacrifices that society required of individuals were unnecessary. That's so remarkable. We discover right now how little obedience we require. I would say little ob obedience goes a long way. And that's a modern liberal discovery. And that is the only possible cause for optimism. I don't know if there is any cause for optimism, but that's another st story. If there is, that is it. But I, I'm very impressed with you having quoted that. It's very nice. Um, but so when you say, what, what, what kinds of sacrifices do you mean? What sacrifices are individuals supposed to make for society? <laughs> Conscription. Mm. It's the highest. I mean, you, you uh, give your life to your nation. I, I have to mention here that Practically all of my childhood friends died in my war of independence. But do you, do you also think it's, it's broader than that? Because for example, you, you mentioned that you think uh, that work is really a, a euphemism for hard work or hard work is really a euphemism for unpleasant work. Um, That's exactly what I said, yes. Yes. And, uh, this seems very related. So it seems yeah. like people doing what they love and yeah. doing it let, voluntarily. Let me say, this is no innovation of mine. Mark Twain said, if you like your work, it's not work. That's a quotation from Mark Twain. And he is really a man after my heart. I thought he might be, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. How nice of you. Um, yes. Um, and just another thing about education and teaching. So in another lecture of yours, you mentioned that you thought Popper was a good teacher because he treated his students as colleagues rather than as pupils. That is correct. Um, what, what would this mean for teachers in practice? So what would it mean? By the way, uh, uh, Popper always uh, craved approval. And what amazed me is that the poorest student in his class, uh, won his gratitude for expression of approval. And for me, I found the very thought of expressing approval to Popper unthinkable. 
And yet David Miller, David Miller is a terrific fellow. You don't know him, do you? Uh, yes, yeah, we know him, yes. You know him. He, he is terrific. He, he could pat Popper on the shoulder and say, Carl, Carl, relax. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how I look at it with, with awe. <laughs> I mean, for me to pat Popper on the shoulder would be just, <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> are you, so are you saying he had a, a, a very informal relationship with his students? With everybody, mm. but it was dangerous because he said something wrong and he would forgive you and not notice it and you do it again and then you feel more relaxed because he permits you and then you cross a thin line that you don't know is there but he knows and then he'd come down on you. And I've seen people shaken with fear as he switched from friendliness to hostility in conversation. Hmm. And of course, he was an enormous personality. I must mention that. He was a very powerful personality. Right. I, mean, uh, I, I, I knew people who were leading intellectuals, say Michael Polanyi, for example, who was, I even met Bertrand Russell. There's nothing so forceful as Popper. I knew, for example, Martin Buber, I knew him well. And Martin Buber was more famous than Popper, there's no question about it. And nothing to compare as personalities. Popper's <laughs> personality was charismatic to an enormous degree. I understand that Wittgenstein was also, I never met Wittgenstein, so I cannot say. Do you think he came across as hostile uh, just because he, he he took ideas so seriously? When he when he came through as hostile, not always, not everybody said he was hostile. Hmm. For example, he had a friend, Findlay, a philosopher, who was not a very famous philosopher, not a very good one, but he was a friend of Popper. And he noticed these things very clearly. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, focusing on more on the good side, or I mean, I could ask you about your experience of teaching as well. Um, so what, I mean, what does it mean for a teacher to treat their students as, as individuals or to treat them as colleagues? What would that mean in practice? Uh, first of all, I owe much of my teaching to Karl Popper, because the main teaching I do and this is my claim for fame is that I teach people to write. I teach not only students, I teach colleagues to write. And I'm very good at it. I'll give you an example. Writing a dissertation takes two to five years. I promise seven months. And I've yet to fail my promise. I mean, seven months net. Mm -hmm. It can take more if you do work and so on, you understand. Mm -hmm. But uh, I teach writing and I'm very good at it. Um, so, that, so is there not, um, is it just a, like when you mentioned this thing about treating students as colleagues, is it more of a, just a general attitude and? Oh, certainly, certainly. Don't pull rank, it's stupid. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. You see, every time one pulls rank, one admits defeat and one admits inability to admit defeat, so both. Mm. And that's too much. Mm -hmm. How come? Could you, could you elaborate on that? Uh, like, wh why is it admitting defeat? When one pulls rank, one both admits defeat and one admits that one cannot admit defeat, which is silly. Because you mean that they don't have an argument or they don't have... Quite. Right. Quite. Mm -hmm. I wrote a paper on the last refuge of the scoundrel. And I say, it's not patriotism, it's a scoundrel. Uh, what, what, what is that? Refuge, last refuge of the scoundrel? The last, oh, you know, Dr. Johnson said, patriotism is the last refuge of the, of the scoundrel. And I wrote a paper on it saying that it's not because patriotism what it is, but because the, strong, the scoundrel is what it is. He needs a refuge. Right. 
I think I see what you mean. Um, I have a couple of more specific questions um, about just uh, yeah historical questions. Um, so one thing that you discuss in the Philosopher's Apprentice is Popper's friendliness with Rudolf Car Rudolf Carnap. Carnap. Yes. Um, and he then went on to falsely portray Popper's criterion of demarcation as a theory of language or a criterion of meaning. meaning. Yeah. Um, and according to your account, the fact that they were friendly made it difficult to, for Popper to even recognize this. And then Hempel went on to repeat the error. Um, the, the, the first quarrel with Popper that I had was that I was his assistant and I helped him write. And he found in a book by Carnap on probability, uh, uh, a target for criticism of inductivism. And he got excited and I didn't understand that. And I said, Carnap does not deserve criticism. And that was the first quarrel I had with Popper. You mean um, like it wasn't even worthy of criticism? I think Carnap is not worthy of criticism. He's considered competent up till today. And I wrote a paper called The Secret of Carnap in which I try to show the opposite. Um, but why do you think Popper didn't, didn't do more to correct their mistakes? Whose mistakes? Um, so Carnap and Hempel's mistake about his... Uh, they were incorrigible. So he just didn't even bother? Uh, you see, Hempel was a lovely person, one of the sweetest people you could find around. And he befriended me. And once when I chaired a meeting, he misrepresented Popper in the manner that you just mentioned. And I asked him to withdraw this and he refused. And I broke off with him. I found it really uh, tasteless. Mm. You see, I'll give you an example, which I give in my book. If you take uh, uh, intuitionism, the intuitionists deny that the negation of negation is a sentence doubly negated. And no one will ascribe this to an intuitionist, even while using it in a discussion of intuitionism. It's just uh, indecent, it's, it's bad manners to fail to recognize the intuitionist's refusal to accept as a general rule, the negation of negation rule. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to accept Popper's claim that the demarcation of science is not the demarcation of language. But you have to say that he doesn't accept it. Mm -hmm. You can say it's silly of him, I ascribe it to him even though he denies it. That's permissible. But you have to say even though he denies it. And Hempel refused to say that and I broke off with him. Mm -hmm. Because this is impolite. Um. Yeah, I, I get the impression that the that reading of the wrong reading of Popper has mostly been discarded. Um, but there's still so something that people often say, if I bring up Popper to just a random person, then they'll say, um, is Popper's criterion of demarcation falsifiable? So they think they they think it's this sort of clever criticism. It is falsifiable. I think I've refuted it. Oh, you mean in your criticism of Popper? Yes. Is that from Science in Flux? Yes. Okay, I still need to read that one. No, uh, I can give it to you now, it's very simple. Oh, yeah. I say, it's true that all science is refutable, but not the other way around. Can you For elaborate? Example, some folk prejudices are refutable. Moreover, the highest refutability we have today is in science-based technology. If you think of a design of an airplane, which is absolutely uninteresting, but you can become rich by getting a good design of an airplane, I don't know if you know, you can get a lot of money by designing a good plane. And that is standing up to refutation. I wrote a book on technology saying, corroboration is not necessary in science, but it is essential in technology. And I explain why and discuss it. So this is my descent from Popper. Hmm. Popper said almost nothing about technology. 
He actually said technology runs by rules of thumb, which is true, but not good enough. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. So you think corroboration is important in technology or applied sciences? In the legal system of Western modern countries, corroboration is required by law. Think of the application of uh, biochemistry to medicine. When you discover a new medication, then you have to corroborate it. And the law says what corroboration is required. If you design a new airplane, then it says you have first to test it mathematically, then by wind tunnel, and then by test pilots. And that's the way to do it, not otherwise. You can't say, no, I'll take a test pilot first and wind tunnel later. No, it's not allowed. So corroboration in the Western modern world is largely a matter of law. And the law is not good enough, of course, so we improve it, like study the mid case and so on. Okay, and do you think, well, so do you, in general, do you think Popper's reputation is better now than it was? Un incomparably. The very fact that you Oxonians mention Popper is something that in my horizon was unthinkable. Not only that, Popper appeared once on the BBC together with Oxonians, and he said that he's ostracized in Oxford and his peers had the goal to deny it. Sorry, and who, and who had the goal to deny it? The Oxford peers. He appeared on the BBC together with the Oxford philosophers. And sorry, and his peers just denied that that happened? That he was, no, in this conversation, he said he was ostracized in Oxford and they said no. Oh, right, okay. Uh, how about Brian McGee? Because he seemed to be very favorable of uh, Popper while he, he worked really in Oxford. Was, certainly. Yes, but you think that even though uh, Brian McGee worked in Oxford, that uh, his colleagues... He wasn't uh, done at Oxford. It was, <laughs> he uh, came later. Ah, uh, right. I see. No, Brian McGee was terrific. There's no question. And he was a friend of mine. I greatly admired him. Yeah, he was an amazing writer and thinker. Oh, he, he, he was such a high success. It's unbelievable. Whereas Popper was really a failure. There's no question. Uh, how, how come? Uh, you know that when Popper was, was a designated knight, he couldn't believe it. Uh, no. He thought there was a mistake. Wow. Yeah, I, again, a story I didn't know. That's, that's also In Oxford, they called LSE London School of Pauperism. <laughs> but pauperism, is it pauperism or pauperism? Pauperism. Right. Yeah. Namely poverty. Right, yes. Certainly. Um, yeah, so the, so it took, yeah, so I mean, it's, it took a while for Popper to, I think, get recognition. Um, and there's also this pattern of new scientific discoveries taking a while to receive yeah. recognition. Yeah. Um, so my last question is um, just if you're familiar with the case of Catalin Carrico, um, have you heard of her story and do you think that she was treated unjustly? No, I don't know, no. It was the, um, it was the, the person who I think she uh, she made the key discoveries that allowed a COVID vaccine to be created and she was fired from her job. She had been doing research on it for a long time and I think she either she either uh, this fired or of had course, been, the, the yeah. father of modern medicine, in case you don't know, is a man called Semmelweis in the mid 19th century and he was actually beaten to death because of it. was lucky that Pasteur and Lister heard about him. This Do you think happen. that this is, you think that this is still 
like people don't beat each other to death anymore but uh we're still very hostile in a, in a similar right. way that is right there is a one of the greatest intellects of the 20th century is a man called Caleb Gatenio. I don't know if you heard about him. He's an educationist. And he wrote, at least they don't give us the hemlock. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting point. Um, just, yeah, because it's, you made it sound like um, this is a just a consistent pattern. So anytime there is any kind of innovation, it it always takes time for it to be recognized. I, I wrote a, a paper called, uh, what is it? Time lag in science or something like that. I, don't, mm. I showed that if a, a new scientific idea occurs not in the establishment, it takes at least two decades for it to appear. Mm. Right, well, thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, I'm going to open it to the rest of the audience. So I think Matyaj was the first person who had a question. Go ahead, Matyaj. Hi. So uh, my question is about uh, criticism. And uh, it, it sort of earlier in the conversation, you were sort of discussing this sort of a bit of a disconnect, I guess, between sort of the recognition of the value of criticism and kind of the practical challenges with sort of delivery and acceptance thereof. And my impression is that one of the things about criticism that often goes unrecognized is that it is often used to shame, to humiliate, to reduce the status oh, of decided, in general. Oh, decidedly, decidedly. Right. Yes. And, and so, and so the, 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 but, but, but all of these elements of it, I guess, are, are, you know, seem to be sort of unrelated with what makes it kind of epistemologically valuable, which is the, the pointing out of conflicts and contradictions between ideas. And so my question, I suppose, is is like, how do you think about, how, how, like, how do you think about delivering criticism in a way that avoids all of those earlier issues and yet still succeeds in delivering the the latter? Let me tell you, I think your question is very important, very central. I'm working on it for a few decades, and I have no answer. It oh. really is an interesting fact. Uh, I, I once wrote a short story about uh, an adjutant who showed the general that his buttons were wrong, done wrong, and he asked him to a duel the next morning. But a war started, and they went, instead of a duel, they went to the battlefield. And then the same adjutant saved the general from ambush by showing him a mistake. Right. See, these are things that come this way and that way. You know, in military life, there is a story that occurs in all literature about the lieutenant who broke down, the sergeant who took over, won the battle, and landed in, in jail. And in the Israeli army, we had a general called Moshe Dayan, who said, in this army, it will not happen. And this is why the Six Day War was such a success, it was against orders. If, if I just sort of quickly follow up, so, so my, my impression is that all of these things that I mentioned, right, they are they're often related with the culture and uh, um, kind of the, the, the sort of the social structure, right? Because, for example, if criticism, um, you know, you know, status and regard and admiration need to work in a certain way in a particular group of people for criticism to be damaging. And, and I'm sort of wondering, like, like, how do you think about sort of the the, the sort of the social structure and social relationships that people might form that might be sort of conducive to criticism. I, I hope that was clear. Karl Popper discusses this in the Open Society and its enemies. And he said, the Open Society has not only to accept criticism, but to encourage it. And he notices rightly that this is a high ideal that doesn't, we don't live up to, but that's the right answer. And I think he was right, of course. Uh, in the Israeli army, there is a requirement that a lieutenant listens to criticism before a battle, doesn't have to accept it, but the law requires that he listens, which I think explains a lot about the Israeli army.
Okay, very nice. Um, so you. just for everyone else, if you have a question, um, please, I think there should be a raise your hand button in the reactions tab. Um, so if anyone else has a question, then please raise your hand. Danny, Danny was first, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, my question is a rather simple one. So you said there, um, Popper was uh, um, paranoid, wasn't the word you used, that he was a suspicious man. Paranoid uh, is the right word, only mildly. Yeah, so was he suspicious of people generally, or was he suspicious of specific kinds of people like in his life? And then you, you mentioned as well with you that he, he almost like, couldn't believe, he thought it was some kind of a mistake that he was a knight. So like this points to a kind of, was he a cynical man to any extent? No, no, on the contrary, he opposed cynicism as a matter of principle. He said the cynic doesn't take the opponent seriously. Hmm. And by the way, here Gellner has a good criticism of Popper. Gellner said some opponents do not deserve criticism which Popper refused to accept. Right. It's a major disagreement between Gellner and Popper and I follow Gellner. Okay, so, so what, do, you, do you have any idea, is it, why, why was, what, was he suspicious of specific people in his life or, or, or was it a general? He was suspicious of everybody who came close to him. Wow, any uh, idea why? For example, in his classes, he always encouraged questions, which was wonderful, mm. but uh, he could easily, so was this, this was this suspicion a product of this kind of like critical attitude? So he was just he was he was so in the mindset of of. of... I, I would say critical attitude gone wild. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, he 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 was suspicious. I remember my first paper. He suspected was an attempt of mine to uh, undervalue the import of his discoveries. Okay, so suspicion was almost like a kind of. Um, psychosocial criticism of, of the people he knew. Okay, no, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, pr um, Professor Brian L. Gomez da Costa. You ask a long time, no speak. Long time, um, long time. How are you? I'm, I'm well. <laughs> you look all right. 2002 in Vienna, since we our paths last crossed. Uh -huh. You ask it. Given the rise of populism, particularly in the United States, given the widespread growth of what I'll call child poverty in both the States and the United Kingdom, and the proliferation of billionaires, is Popper's optimism still justified or justifiable? First of all, let me say, Popper considered optimism not an evaluation, but an imperative. That's very important. He said it's very easy to be pessimistic and lose, lose uh, motivation to fight for improvement. Uh, as I put it, we should always give the good Lord the benefit of doubt. Uh, by the way, as far as economics is concerned, the multi-billionaires in the States or anywhere else uh, do not count one way or another. The only thing that the multi-billionaire can do of any value is to create some new charities as Bill Gates does. That's the only thing one can do. Otherwise they don't signify. This is really a direct consequence of the quantity theory of the money. I don't want to go to, into economics, but uh, populism is important. Populism is excess democracy, which is a danger, the greatest danger to democracy as we saw from uh, the United States recent uh, history. But one has to say that populism was strong in America in the middle of the 19th century in the debate about bimetallism. So it really has roots in American democracy, populism. And Americans have constantly to be aware of it. And to be aware of it. Do you remain an optimist? As I told you, I consider it a duty. 
It's very carry. hard to be an optimist in Israel today. I hope you're right. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Jonathan Clapsaddle. Hi. Um, Dr. Agassi, I, I want to take advantage of your <clears throat> years uh, um, with, with Popper in the 50s and before. Um, there's been something made in uh, Popper circles on Facebook, uh, primarily in the critical rationalist group. Some of this goes back to, Wat to Watkins, but it's come up again. Um, Popper's statements about truth as an aim of science. Yes. Two things have been made of, uh, uh, of this. First of all, one is wondering why he waits until the late 50s to say this. Uh, Wonderful uh, question. Wait, that was, thank you. <laughs> One and uh, two. Of course, this is this is coming from the fact that, as Popper says already in *Logic der Forschung*, that uh, strict disproof is not available to us either. Has led some critical rationalists to say, yeah. "Well, all we can talk about is a relationship between yeah. statements and yeah. basic statements." And I was curious first, uh, uh, just historically, as you were with Popper in those early years, uh, if you can tell us what he was thinking as far as you can tell in that direction, and of course, your own position on this. First of all, it's very interesting because his first paper on this was his paper on Berkeley. And he, before he wrote it, he discussed it with Feyerabend and me. So I remember very well how he developed his ideas. But let me say this, Popper clarified whatever he touched upon, except for one point where he is to blame for a constant confusion. The word positivism applies to anti-metaphysics as such. The word logical positivism applies to the op opinion that logic shows metaphysics impossible. Again, positivism is the assertion that metaphysics is impossible and logical positivism is buttressing it with logic. And that is Wittgenstein, not before Wittgenstein. And Popper constantly insisted that he was not a positivist because he never followed Wittgenstein and he was a positivist. Not a logical positivist, but a positivist. Mm -hmm. And he came out of it first by discussing determinism. And when he wrote about determinism, he said that this was a shift a methodological shift in him discussing a metaphysics. By the way, his discussion of determinism is superb. I don't wish now to belittle it by a jot, but just to say that it was for him a growth. Because in Logic the Forschung, he said, indeterminism, no, sorry, in the open society and its enemies, he says, indeterminism in common sense suffices. And in metaphysics, it doesn't matter whether you are a determinist or not, as long as in common sense you are an indeterminist. This is a quotation from the Open Society. And later he changed, he was anti-determinist. And he wrote his postscript is mainly anti-determinism. And he said in the postscript that this is a switch. So he knew that he was first anti-metaphysics and then pro-metaphysics. And yet he said, I never was a positivist means meaning a Wittgenstein metaphysics. I hope I answered you somewhat. And Thank I you. was particularly sensitive with it because I came from metaphysics. You say I'm a physicist, but I entered physics as a metaphysician. Mm -hmm. Thank Great. you. Okay, and Matthias has another question. Yeah, so you also mentioned that you uh, teach people how to write. Uh, and judging, judging, you know, from from your work, you have been sort of absolutely prolific. Um, but many people seem to sort of struggle with with sort of producing sort of large large volumes of writing. So I mean, I suppose this is too too long a subject for a question. But I, as I assume, you know, more than than just people will be interested in this. Uh, what is kind of your main advice as it comes to writing? First of all, let me sidetrack and say, people struggle with themselves regularly. In my opinion, if you struggle with yourself, lay down your weapons, go home, go into seclusion, work with yourself, make peace with yourself. Until you make peace with yourself, you owe nobody anything. Just make peace with yourself. When you come out of your seclusion, then we can talk. 
So first of all, anyone who recommends work hard, I am opposed to him, including Popper. Uh, Popper said to me, Yoske, you just say that you don't like to work hard, but you work hard with me. And indeed, I worked very hard with him, 12 hours a day at least. But I don't believe in hard work. I think it's unnecessary. I think it's destructive. There's no need for it. If you love your work, that's good enough. And people who don't love their work either should leave their work or should make peace with themselves. So I hope I answered you somewhat. So in other words, writing shouldn't be a struggle because if it's a struggle, that means that you're, you haven't made peace with yourself. Like you're all, all good artists say that an artist who struggles is not a good artist. I mean, of course, there can be other struggles. Van Gogh struggled with himself, but not as an artist. As an artist, he was at peace with himself. And in fact, he painted in order to live in peace. You know, he was a preacher professionally. Okay, great. Um, and next question is from Margarita Hendricks. Sorry, you're muted. I'll just ask you to unmute. Margarita, where are you? I'm here. Hello. Hello, yes. hello, Margarita. Long time. Yes. Uh, the, the question that I have is the following. It, it, it regards that footnoting conjectures and refutation, and I, I think it has been already addressed, but I, I still like to know uh, your perspective, uh, where you point out that there is in his discussions um, a level of uh, verificationism or inductivism, and that Popper then says, I'm rather uh, a verificationist or an inductivist and an instrumentalist. And what I'm particularly interested in is your views on, on his rejection of instrumentalism, because it makes me wonder whether Popper actually fully understood what was going on in, in pragmatism. There's all the different things that were happening in pragmatism. And also how you felt when because what I read there is that Popper wasn't listening to you, that maybe you were trying to say something that went much further than, than these distinctions. And so how, um, I mean, you have written about that in your book, but, but how do you think about that now? Or, or how do you keep on thinking about that? The Popper's philosophy might have developed in a very different way if we had actually listened. First of all, uh, the contrast realism, instrumentalism comes from the Greek distinction between truth by nature and truth by convention. That one shows that science is after truth by nature is very easy. Look at the theory of elasticity. The theory of elasticity denies the atomicity of matter. Nobody who knows the theory of elasticity accepts this for a minute, except as a convention. Mm -hmm. And that shows to me, that is to say, the fact that portions of science are instrumentalist prove that science is not. Mm -hmm. So to me, these things are easy. But the point is that realism was the idea that science is true. And Popper learned from Frege the great idea that meaning is truth value, not truth. Uh -huh. And he took seriously the fact that it's easy to refute, although not to verify, which is after all what Socrates said. The Popper at the end of his life, he said, look, after all the years of hard work, I arrived at the pre-Socratics. This is a quotation from Popper. Mm -hmm. And this is really shows that Popper was a very humble man, he was a very lovely man, there's no question about it. And the ability of Popper to consider realism, not truth, but truth or falsity, that was the great move. Mm -hmm. And the disdain for falsity comes from the history of religion 
since my gospel comes from the mouth of the Lord, it is blasphemy to think that I am mistaken. Yes. And it is break away from the religious tradition that gets you straight into the ability to think again, true or false, not true, but true or false. Or false, yeah. That I think is so great about Popper. Popper said that he just applied the Socratic idea to modern science. Now, this was so great because it was contrary to everything in his tradition. All right, to, to be continued. To be continued. Yeah. Okay, next question from Bruno Marx. Sorry, you're muted. I'll just unmute you. Okay, hello, Professor Agassiz. Hello, um, hello. You said uh, Popper was suspicious of everybody, um, but some people were his friends. Uh, like Hayek says uh, several times that uh, he considered Popper his friend. And uh, can you tell us how much influence did Hayek's uh, friendship and uh, intellectual uh, interchanges with uh, uh, Popper have on Popper? And uh, what was the impact of Hayek's book, uh, The Sensory Order? First of all, Popper never studied the sensory order. He studied his economic works more seriously. And the man funny thing is that both Popper and Hayek expressed strong disagreement with each other without naming the one they disapprove of. Hayek says, those who believe in checks and balances are naive. That is Hayek's word, naive. Now, who believes in checks and balances? The author of the Open Society. But the fact is, and I am ashamed for both Hayek and Popper for their concealment of their criticism from each other. It is unbecoming. That's interesting. Um, and Popper yeah. criticizes the free, what he calls the free market ideology in the open society. So he says it's inconsistent, he says. Criticizing is a weak word here. He puts the biggest guns against Hayek without naming him. Okay, very interesting. Does, Thank that, you. Answer, does that answer your question, Bruno? Uh, yeah, but so the point is, uh, Professor Agassiz thinks that uh, the sensory order was never uh, studied by Popper. I don't think Popper ever read it, no. Huh. Interesting. Huh. But I want to stress that Popper said Hayek saved my life. Yeah. And he meant it, he meant it. And so he felt unable to criticize yeah. Hayek openly. Yeah. And in some discussion, he said that the disagreement between Hayek and his opponent is only verbal. Now, Popper said no disagreement is verbal. He quotes in the logic of Horsham Kant to say every disagreement, however verbal, has a true disagreement behind it. That's the motto of logic of Horsham. And yet he said of Hayek sometimes that it was a purely verbal disagreement. Maybe because they considered liberty such a fundamental uh, value. Oh, we all do, we all do. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you're quite right. Okay, next question from Jesse. You are muted though, so you'll have to unmute yourself. There you are. Hey, how's it going? Uh, you said Popper didn't think a lot about technology uh, and you wrote a, a book in Hebrew. Sorry, I said didn't write. Mm-hmm. And you wrote a book, uh, The Philosophy of Technology. Uh, the book is called Technology, yes. Mm, uh, it looks like it's only written in Hebrew. I'd love to read it. No, but, it's written uh, in English. In English, send me an email and I'll send you the, co the book. Ah, awesome. Uh, well, here's a question. Uh, if you were to live forever uh, in the next 100 years or so, what technology are you most optimistic about? And as an intuition pump, uh, you know, there's virtual reality, there's all this stuff happening in biotech, uh, SpaceX and space exploration. 
Uh, I, and then there's just I, the I internet answer, technology. I answered this in my book, the technology to control technology. Is that in the sense of like a uh, government regulation or what are you talking about? Yeah, not only, but yes. Not only uh, regulations, but also tools for government to regulate. It's very interesting that monitors are instruments that are very useful, for example, for doctors, because doctors see death daily, and there's always question whether it's neglect or in inability. And so the monitors are tools for doctors to defend themselves. And yet the medical profession was against monitoring. This is very funny. Outside of medicine, do you think, uh, I, I don't know, I think these days most people hear regulation in tech and, and they think about regulating misinformation of things like Facebook or no, uh, no, is no. that different, different? One is not allowed to regulate misinformation. One could regulate uh, expressions of malice, which is different. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a brief question. Uh, namely, you said that you came from physics. Yes. And I'm very curious uh, what you also could I ask you, because um, I can't quite see you, it would it be possible for you to lower your camera slightly. Ah, right. Yes, I can see you better now. Um, yeah, uh, what, uh, what kind of physics were you interested in before you got into philosophy? First, it was quantum mechanics, especially EPR. Ex interested me a lot. And secondly, elementary particles. Nice. Yeah. But, that's... Also, but also cosmology, of course. Actually, I, I passed my exams in physics because I took cosmology as a part of my studies and my professors couldn't teach it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, EPR is especially interesting. Um, oh, yes. Yes, yeah. very serious, yes. Uh, and yeah, I don't know if you still have a stance on, on those debates, uh, on the locality debate in quantum theory. No, no, of course, I, I always thought that the expression for Norman proof is a lie. And when Bell came out, it came out that way. Right. I thought Bell did a marvelous job, even though Bell's paper is on probability, not on quantum mechanics. Very interesting. Nice. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was just, that, that's a fascinating answer. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, um, yeah, I'll hand it back to Liberty. Matthias, again. Yeah, so, so another question. So you mentioned uh, Martin Buber uh, at some point, and that, that sort of made me wonder. So it seems to be the case that. Um, the early 20th century Vienna was sort of like this sort of epicenter for thinking about psychology, right? You sort of had people like Freud, Adler, uh, Jung, and it seems to be the case that Popper was actually sort of involved with quite a lot of these people, although in his work, he seems to mostly be sort of critical of them. So my yeah, question he, is... He uh, worked with Adler, yes. And so, so my question is, like, like what, what, what do you think their influence on him was, and how do you see the value of all of that psychology work? Uh, how do you sort of personally see its value? This question is uh, very tricky for me because I've read Popper's early works and I can tell you that in his autobiography, he says wrong things about it. He says, for example, that he solved the problem of induction when he was a teenager working for Adler. And his story about Adler is misinterpreted by him, according to him, and moreover, uh, uh, he, in his 20s, wrote papers that were A, inductivist, B, ridiculed Leibniz as a metaphysician, which I think is, a, how shall I say, what Einstein called sins of youth, nothing more, not serious, but it's not what Popper said. So it's hard for me to discuss early Popper. But certainly, his great ideas he developed later. And fascinating, thanks. Uh, okay. The Biden Probleme, which is his manuscript that he lost and then was found and so on, 
uh, is, a, is a fascinating book, but he really worked very hard towards it. And as John Wetterton shows, it was towards the end of the manuscript that he developed his anti-inductivist idea. And so he stopped writing Dividing Good Probleme and wrote Logik der Forschung instead. And that for me was a breakthrough of the first order. And it amazes me that Popper denies what I've just said. Okay, uh, and there is a question from Roy in the chat. Uh, so he's written, re Gellner and people who do not deserve criticism. Um, is this in the sense that they're not worthy of criticism? How can you tell who deserves criticism and who doesn't? And how does that fit with? First of all, this is a wonderful question. Secondly, you can be wrong about it for sure. Thirdly, you have to follow your interest. If what they say is interesting, you attack it. If it's not interesting, either read them again or forget them. Don't attack them. In my opinion, really, one of the greatest things that you learn from Popper is whom not to attack. And he was just uh, so much addicted to hard work that he didn't, couldn't take his own advice. Okay. Um, he also, Roy also asked, uh, how does that sit with what you said earlier about engaging COVID deniers and conspiracy theorists? I hope I've just answered it. Thank you. It's the right question. Let me say again. Okay, great. On the whole, let me say one word. There is such thing as filters. We know that without filters, we cannot see uh, when we lose our sensual uh, filters by taking strychnine, we die. Uh, when you go to a library unprepared, you sink in it at once. So we need filters all the way and no courses on filters exist. That amazes me. I teach my students always to build their own filters and to know that no filters is right. So you constantly have to improve your filters. And then the question is how much you put into the filters and how much you put into using the filters. These questions are unanswerable. Because they're related to people's specific problem situation. Exactly so. You are very good. Very nice. Oh, uh, Liberty, I couldn't hear you, but you were speaking. So, oh, um... uh, Yes, does anyone else, we have a few more minutes for questions. So does anyone else have a question? If so, raise your hand. Yeah. Not um, Harry, yes, Harry. Observation on that last point. I, I remember a story I think Popper told of uh, being in a lecture and in trying to instruct the, the students to, to write down everything they observe. And a lot of people were happy with this, but obviously some rightly not. Uh, and it's very, very apposite to think of that in terms of we, we all put filters in, whether we know it or not, and if we, we ought to know it. Yeah, uh, you're quite right. You are very good. Uh, let me say also that all espionage systems suffer from excess information. And this is why, for example, the Israeli espionage was very good once when they had very little information. <laughs> That's always so you find after every disaster that there was information about it somewhere in your background information that you could not notice because you were uh, attacked by too much information. Uh, this is very well known, by the way, the eye takes enormous amount of information, which goes to a gland called genicula, and the genicula filters most of the information. Most of the information that reaches your eye does not reach your brain. This is a very important fact. This is quite generally so. But let me say to all of you, first of all, I enjoyed this meeting very much. You are very lively people and it's a pleasure to talk with you. And I'm available, you can always email to me anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did, um, did you want to leave it there uh, or can you take one more question from Danny again? I'm always at your available. Uh, it's completely fine. I, I don't mind if, if, if you wanted to cut it there, that's fine with me. Or uh, uh, shoot, shoot. 
Um, yeah, like, I suppose I, I'm going to ask you a question that you've probably been asked a thousand times. So apologies if you have. But um, if 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 Popper was this, you know, wonderful, friendly, um, uh, kind, and open-minded kind of person as, that you've been describing, and I have no doubt that your description is is accurate. I, I have heard some people describe that uh, he had an, a reputation of, of of not being very nice, so of not being very open and that he he didn't reflect his own philosophy very well sometimes in terms of uh criticism and is there where, where do you first of all do you, so there's it doesn't sound like you agree with that at all but if, if you don't where did this where did this myth come from then i give you for example papa was a talker he talked non-stop mm. and instead of a dialogue he would look at your face and learn from that what your objections are. And he would tell you, this is your objection and we'll go on. <laughs> and he was usually very good. For example, I used to bring him information about books he never knew about, mm -hmm. never suspected about. And he would correct me. And first I was pissed. You know, I come with information about the book I read and he corrects me. And I would go back to the book and he usually was right. <laughs> but when he was wrong, I was a liar. Okay, so now that really was a bit hard to take. So he rubbed people up the wrong way. Then is 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 that he rubbed people the wrong way? First of all, because he said what they should have said, and they wanted to hear themselves talk. If you are more interested in ideas than in whether you talk or not, then you listen to Popper. Most people who uh, were upset about Popper wanted more to partake than to learn. And then they made a mistake. The, of course, the man who did most harm to Popper was a man called Moritz Schlick. Schlick was a man who got a fan letter from Einstein and then in a manner which I cannot make sense of became a follower of Wittgenstein. And when he saw Popper, he realized that he made a mistake that Popper got it all right. And we know this because of his correspondence but what he said publicly is that Popper is not so different from us, but he tries to make himself look as different from us as possible because he wants to, uh, what is it, to, to stand out. Now, this is stupid and ad hominem and unworthy of a man like Schlick. And this is still quoted by people today. Schlick is dead since the 30s, mm. nearly a century since he died. And still, people quote this silly thing of his. So, do you think it was due to, um, uh, let's say, misleading or misleading statements or lies by others? No, no. It's it a lack of sense of proportion. I met many people whose conduct is much nicer, mm. and I've met more people whose conduct is much worse than that of Popper. Mm. So. I mean, Popper is outstanding as a thinker, but yeah. as far as an individual behavior, it's more or less normal. Yeah, okay. Because I, I can imagine- The generosity that was unusual, it was fairly normal. Because it, it relates to some of your comments as well about like teachers and you know when you're going to take, um, teachers should take their students seriously, treat them as peers, as colleagues. And, and I agree with that totally, but it certainly, um, it, it it would be it's, it makes uh, the teacher student relationship a very uh, difficult thing to to a very difficult line to walk sometimes surely because it involves the teacher taking the student seriously enough to criticize criticize them presumably quite a lot when the student is first you know learning the ropes which can be hard to take indeed let me end with one item of information uh, i told popper about faraday suffering from a wall of silence which actually made him lose his mind. And Popper was extremely impressed because he suffered from a wall of silence. Wall of silence as in people not um, paying much attention, not, not listening to him. No, no, no. It is a taboo to mention him. Ah, okay, wow. It was taboo to mention. Faraday was mentioned as a discoverer. Actually, there was a book about him called Faraday as a discoverer. But his ideas were not mentioned, and his best friend wrote a paper after he died explaining why he did not mention his ideas before he died. This is all in my book on Faraday. Wow. And Faraday really, uh, more or less, uh, he, he died senile. 
And this was a major cause for his senility. The wall of silence it was too much to take. Okay, all right, okay. I, I don't wanna, I, I, I have so many more questions, but I think I'll just leave it like that. Um, First of all, you have my email. You can find it easily in the internet. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, um, thanks again so much. Um, we... I want to thank all of you. You are a pleasure. You are with a lot of moxie and go on, push on.